Uh, thank you for coming. We're delighted to have you here at the Oriental Institute. And we hope that after the presentation, you might have a chance to uh, go look at the Marisalmon exhibit or come back the next time you're in Hyde Park. Uh, one of the great joys of the Oriental Institute is just dipping in for a few minutes. And so it's a good place to just come and take bits of at a time. So my uh, part of the program tonight is to tell you something about Marisalmon herself. Now, the mummy and coffin of Marisalmon have been in our collection since 1920. She was purchased in Luxor by James Henry Breasted, who, of course, was the uh, founder of the Oriental Institute. And this op special exhibit gave us the opportunity to really think more in detail about her life and her times and what it meant to be a temple singer and what this really meant for a woman in 800 BC at the time she lived. Now, we're able to focus on this very distant history by telling the story of a, an individual person. And this is a wonderful way of making the distant past come very, very much in focus. Because this particular mummy has not only in the inscription on the front her name, Marisalmon, as you can see, but also very, very handy and very important, it has her job description that she was a singer in the interior of the Temple of Amun. So she was a working, she was a, she was a working woman. Uh, now, unfortunately, the, although we have her name and her job description, on the coffin, we don't have the name of her parents, so we don't have that sort of information, and we know nothing about her tomb. This mummy was purchased, as I mentioned, in 1920 by Breasted in Luxor, and so we don't know where it came from. But the style of the coffin allows us to establish, without any doubt, when she lived, because styles of coffins change, so she lived about 800 BC, and that also her title, the singer in the interior of the Temple of Amun, confirms that she lived in the Luxor area where Breasted bought this coffin, because that particular title, singer in the interior of the Temple of Amun, is associated with the great Temple of Amun at Karnak, who's shown here. So flashback to 800 BC. Thebes was the greatest city in the ancient world. It was full of soaring temples, as you can see here, a few nice people for scale. And it was the center of the economy. It was so important that even the kings of Egypt were buried in the western part of this city. So if we look at the temple today, uh, other than tourists, it's very, very quiet. It's, uh, the colors are gone, the sounds are gone, the smells are gone. But it's important to remember what it was like when Maris Amun was working in this temple. And this is a wonderful reconstruction of what the temple looked like. It was a beehive of activity. There were hundreds and hundreds of people who were moving in and out of this temple every day. People like different levels of priests, the singers like Maris Amun, uh, doorkeepers, porters, uh, many, many different types of professions that we have very good records of who was actually working in this temple. We don't know the exact number, but it must have been hundreds of people. So her job title is very important for understanding what she was doing. This title, Singer in the Interior of the Temple of Amun, indicates that she was part of a divine qu choir, a group of women who sung during certain musical uh, during certain religious ceremonies. So you might say, well, why do you need music? What sort of ceremonies needed music? So just to regress for a moment, to understand how this whole thing worked with Maris Amun is the temple, the main part of the temple is to the, um, is to the left toward the back where you see the obelisks. And each of these temples, this is the Luxor temple, these structures were considered to be the, the home of the god and that the god actually lived in the middle of the temple, in the sanctuary. The sanctuary was really considered to be the bedroom of the god. The statue of the god that represented the deity stood in a naos, which is a shrine, in that sanctuary. And these statues were made out of very, very precious wood. We're not sure if we have any that really survive, but we have one text from Ramses VI where he describes the statue as being a very good nib wood, a particular sort of wood, and Persia wood, the torso colored and all of its limbs of faience, like real jasper, and its kilt hammered of yellow gold, its crown of lapis lazuli adorned with serpents of every color. The uraeus on its head was of six-fold gold inlaid with real stones, its sandals of six-fold gold. And so you have to imagine the resident in these temples were these incredible composite statues. Now what's very important about these, um, as I mentioned, we're not sure if we have any. One possible candidate is this one in a collection in Japan. And very important to note, it's made out of silver and gold 
gold was considered to be the skin of the gods, and silver was considered to be the bones of the gods. So it's very symbolic, the materials they're using. So the confluence between the singers and ritual and the gods is that the gods were thought to be modeled on humans, and the gods needed what humans needed. In other words, they needed food and drink. And so the gods were actually even patterned on humans, many of them. In the middle of this image is the god Amun, with his two tall, uh, crown, uh, his two tall plumed crowns. And uh, Amun is the god who Meris Amun served. Meris Amun means Amun loves her. And so this is the deity that she served. So the gods needed food and drink. This was supplied to them three times a day during offering ceremonies when the chief priest, after undergoing purification rituals, accompanied by the choir, in other words, Marisaman, would go back into the sanctuary of the temple. They'd open the doors to that shrine where the god lived, and he would then present food, drink, perfume, clothing, different things to the deities. This was enacted three times a day in every single temple in Egypt, and there were probably countless temples in Egypt. And so it's important to remember the economic feature of these temples, that a huge amount of material was moving through these temples, because a representative sample of the, for example, the, the vegetables or the fruits would be laid in front of the god, and after a suitable time for the god to consume them, they would be taken away, and then the bulk of that, there, there was a lot more of it, in addition to the representative sample, would then be distributed to the priests and the temple workers. And this is how Marisaman was paid. She was paid a proportion of all of the material that was laid before the god when she was on watch. We have um, countless scenes of offerings, these offering scenes, much like this, and several papyri that actually are scripts for this daily offering service. So it's incredible how much we actually know about what was going on. So why was Marisaman part of these ritual actions? Why was music important? Texts indicate that the gods were thought to be soothed and placated by music. Again, this is part of their human nature. They loved music. And so we have wonderful texts. This is Queen Nofertari, the chief queen of Ramses II, and a description of her. Here she's performing as a temple musician. And it describes her as, see her, her hands shaking the sistra, which are the rattles we see here, to bring pleasure to the god, her father Amun. How lovely she moves, her hair bound with ribbons, songstress with perfect features. Pleasure is in her lips' motions. Her heart is all kindness, her words gentle to those upon earth. One lives just to hear her voice. So obviously these musicians were very well regarded by people. They had prestigious jobs. Now the association of music and temple ritual is further expressed through uh, myths and one very important deity in association with this is Hathor, who's shown here with the lyre-horned crown. She is very closely, asso closely asso associated with women, but also with music. She's called the Lady of Music and the Lady of Dance. She's also associated with ancillary um, activities like drinking and sex and you know, the, f the fun things in life. So we can elaborate upon this connection between the goddesses, music, and temple ritual by certain myths from the time of Marisaman. And there are two particular myths. One is called the Eye of the Sun, the other is called the Distant Goddess, and there are a lot of variations in these different myths. But basically, the gist of it is that there is a cat-headed goddess called Tefnut, Bastet, a number of different names, also Hathor with a cat head, who is the daughter of the sun god Re. And she becomes very upset because people are disobeying her father. And she runs away from Egypt. And she goes to probably Nubia or Libya. It's a distant place, hence the distant goddess. And she's so angry that there she assumes the form of a raging lioness associated with the goddess Sekhmet. And she creates all sorts of problems. She's killing people and creating havoc. And the gods in Egypt know that they need her back in Egypt, and so they send an emissary, the god Thoth, to the goddess, the raging goddess. And he persuades her to come back to Egypt by reminding her of the beautiful music and dance in the temples of Egypt. She misses it so much, she comes back to Egypt. Once she returns, she assumes the form of a cat. 
And so here we have this wonderful Egyptian sort of ambiguity of felines, of the docile cat that can turn around and scratch you, or the cat that can also assume the form of a lion and then go back to being a very docile cat. Any cat uh, owner, of course, recognizes this. And there's a text that summarizes, when Hathor is angry, she is Sekhmet. When Hathor is happy, she is Bastet, who is the goddess shown here. And in fact, this little figurine of Bastet shows her in the guise of a temple musician holding the instruments we'll talk about in just a minute. Well, who were the musicians during the time of Marisamen? We have many records of them, both in texts and representations. We know these women were from elite families in Thebes. Uh, there were many different levels of, pre of singers. You would enter as just a singer. You would then become a singer of a particular god. Then you would become a singer in the temple of that god. And then you'd become, as Marisamen was, a singer in the interior of the temple of a particular god. Egypt was very bureaucratic. And so this is also seen with the, with the uh, singers. There is uh, no evidence for formal training of these women. They were probably apprenticed. Uh, to their mothers because we see records of families where two or three generations of women have singer titles. And so this is also parallel because many of the crafts boys were trained by their fathers, so it seems like a, a fairly good inference to, to make. Women could become singers very young in life. We have a mummy of a woman, a very young woman who's about eight years old, and her coffin says that she was a singer. And so people entered this profession very young and then presumably moved up through the ranks. Now the singers don't have a distinctive dress. This is from the Art Institute. This is a singer of Amun, king of the gods, her name, and her name is Kiwi. And here she's wearing just the, the general upper class, elite, beautiful pleated linen gown. Marisamen in on her coffin is shown, of course not with a gown because she's shown as a mummy, but she's shown with this very distinctive vulture headdress, but this is not characteristic of the singers. This is worn by other people as well. So the singers sort of blended in with other people. It's also uh, important to note that singers uh, were organized into groups called phyles. This is a, a Greek term, but the point is that the, these groups, these phyles would serve one at a time. So there'd be a group of women who are called the first phyle, second, third, and fourth. The first phyle would serve for one month and then would go off duty for three months. And so most of these women were part-time singers in the temple, which is very telling about Egyptian temple life because many people have the assumption that Egyptian priests and priestesses were full-time, and that's not true. So people were constantly serving and then going back to their duty as a overseer of the chariot or as a uh, some other profession. It gives you a much different sense of how much people were engaged with the temple in ancient Egypt. Well, where and when did Maris Amun play and what sort of instruments? Now, we have a lot of scenes which show women playing instruments. The main instrument that the temple singers used were the sistrum. This is Nofertari, uh, uh, Nofertari again, with her rattles called sistra. And there are two basic types of them. The ones you see here are similar to this one in our collection. These are ritual rattles. The crossbars would have supported discs or little tangs. And when this was shaken, it would have made a, a clanging noise. Not very melodic by our standards, but this is ancient Egypt. And the one in the exhibit, which I encourage you to look at very, very carefully, is a spectacular example. This is from about 300 years later than Marisamen. But here you can see the iconography of that myth that I mentioned to you. Um, in, above the handle is the face of the goddess Hathor. And then above is a little temple. And if you look inside the temple, you can see a little cat-headed goddess with her own sistrum. And so this represents Hathor and then the placated form of the goddess who was brought back to Egypt by the allure of the music and dance. And then if you look at the very top, you can see the most kind of docile form of a cat, so a, a mother cat nursing her kittens. So all of this is an allusion to that idea of the angry goddess who went and was placated, brought back by music. This is um, no doubt an example that was really used. It's very, very heavy. It again is missing its tangs or discs or whatever would have made the percussive sound. 
Now the other, and here's another view of it. Now another instrument that's really kind of odd is the beaded necklace that is held by the woman on the right. It's in her right hand. This is called a menot. And a menot is, is, as I said, it's a beaded necklace with a sort of paddle-shaped ornament on the back that would have hung down the back of the neck. This is called a counterpoise. These counterpoises were usually used with heavy necklaces to keep the string off the neck of the wearer, so you could actually position the necklace. For unknown reasons, this particular necklace became a ritual musical instrument. There are very few of these around. There's one in the Metropolitan. This is from the University of Bonn in Germany. And um, so it shows the multiple strands and the, the paddle-shaped counterpoise. We think this was sacred to Hathor. Well, we know it's sacred to Hathor, but we think it was sacred to Hathor because this was shaken, and the rustling sound of the beads seems to have been equated with the sound of papyrus in the marsh, of dried papyrus in the marsh. And there is a very important ritual, sacred to Hathor, in which papyrus is pulled out of the marsh for her. And so by extension, we think this is probably the symbolism of the menot. But we see scenes of, of, of uh, musicians shaking a, a sistrum and then shaking the menot. Now musicians would play First of all, during the, during the daily offering service was a major time, and probably, well, Marisaman, because of her high rank, would be able to go back toward the sanctuary. The other women with lower ranks would stay in other parts of the temple. But a very important feature of these musicians was that they would accompany the god when he went out of the temple. And the god, again, like a human, didn't want to stay in his bedroom all the time, he wanted to get out. And so the Egyptians developed this really wonderful theology and iconography where the statue of the god would be removed from its shrine and placed in another shrine, which you can see on top of this boat. It would be placed on the boat, which is a, a sacred boat. And that was then supported on long carrying poles placed on the shoulders of a double file of priests. This particular god is um, it's actually the deified king. And you can see it has a billowing white linen shroud around it. In certain periods, they let the shrine show. Sometimes they, they shroud it like this one. And so in this form, the god would leave the temple, would go to another temple. He'd go around the temple. He'd visit. Uh, he'd give oracles, do different, different uh, things in the community. And it was a time of great community involvement because people could actually see the god. Although they couldn't see the statue, they had contact with the god. And we know that musicians accompanied these processions. And these processions and festivals could be pretty wild. This is a scene of temple musicians accompanying one of these processions. And here we can see men and women musicians. In the upper right, a man playing a harp. In the lower register to the right, three temple musicians with their sistra and their menots. You can see the rattles and the beaded necklaces. And behind them, to the, to the left, are three men and they are clapping. The hieroglyphic inscription is very handy. It reads, it's like a comic book. It says, clapping to keep the beat. And, and then behind them are guys that says, ibu, which means dancing, which is pretty obvious they're dancing. And then above is this wonderful scene of uh, women acrobatic dancers doing backflips. And so these processions were time of huge commotion in the community, a lot of music, a lot of dance. And Although in the temple, the sistrum and the menot seem to be the instruments that were played, once they get outside the temple, you see scenes like this with harps and different types of instruments, side-blown flutes as here, different types of dancers. So there was a tremendous amount of music associated with ritual in ancient Egypt. So as I mentioned, when they get outside the temple, they play a wider range of instruments. One is this spectacular harp, which is in our exhibit. This was excavated by Lord Carnarvon, who later discovered the tomb of King Tutankhamun. And the dating on this is a little bit hard to say, probably about 1000 BC. It is, uh, it, it's missing its membrane that went over the, sa the soundboard, or the, 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 uh, the main part of the harp. So when this was intact, the vibration of, this, of the four strings would have been transmitted to the membrane over the, uh, the sounding board. And it's wonderful in Egyptology because you don't have to sort of guess how these things were played. This is how they were played. 
This is called a, a shoulder harp, and you can see it has four strings, just like our harp, so it was balanced on the shoulder of the musician, who would then pluck it with both hands. Other instruments, this clap stick that's in our exhibit, this is from a time earlier than Marisamen, but we know that they used these during her time as well. And we have wonderful scenes here of men playing clapsticks. They're played in pairs. And so ours actually has a, uh, you can see a, a little hole at the end to attach it to its pair. The other, the other one of this, by the way, is in the British Museum. And so they would be used like castanets. And these are played by both men and women. These are kind of a fancier type with, head, with heads on them rather than in the form of hands. And here we have another scene of a procession. This is the great festival of Opet, one of the great annual festivals. And you can see the range of instruments being played here from the right, men with, um, excuse me, from the left, men with, with lutes, and then more men with clapsticks. The feathers indicate these are people from Libya. Men keeping the beat again. It says singers uh, of the first phyle at the front of the troop of this great god clapping, and then behind him is a guy with a big drum around his neck, slung around his drum, uh, around his neck, sort of like a, like a big conga drum. And so a lot of music, a lot of dancing, lots of commotion in these, in these festivals. Now, we also know that musicians played in other contexts, not only in sacred contexts like temples and in uh, festivals, but also in banquet scenes. And we have a lot of wonderful scenes from private tombs that show this is from the time of earlier than Marisamen, but because this is outside of the temple context, we see a wider range of instruments here, some sort of flute or oboe and a lyre played by women, or here a wonderful scene of, of, a, of a banquet with women clapping to keep the beat and a woman with a double oboe. And so music was an important part of the life of the ancient Egyptians. Now, these scenes do not say that these people are temple singers, so it's very likely that there were a lot of people who were non-professional musicians who, who would play at banquets. Now, unfortunately, I mean, this is the question everybody asks, we don't know what the music sounded like. There was no system of notation at all. So we have no idea of the rhythms. We have no idea of the tones. Uh, but the thing that's very interesting is in spite of that, we do have lyrics because very often alongside the temple scenes, we have hieroglyphic texts that preserve the lyrics. And here's a sample of one. How great is Amun, the beloved god. He rises in Karnak, his city, the lord of life. The beautiful face of Amun, the beloved power at whom the gods love to look as the mighty one who came forth from the horizon. The whole land of Amun's domain is in festival. It is happy for Amun. It is he who mankind loves. And so this is clearly lyric singing. This is not just a bunch of chanting. And it's quite interesting because until about, well, most ethnomusicologists looking at Egyptian stuff, because of the, the sistrum and the menot being percussion instruments, assumed it had to be just chanting of some sort. But these lyrics occur alongside scenes of women with sistra and menots. So even in the absence of, of the melodies, the richness of the imagery and the lyrics of the temple music really indicate that uh, music was a it was a tremendous adoration of the god. Well, what was Mara Salman's like, life like outside the temple? Important for understanding that is um, something quite astounding from ancient Egypt is that men and women, this is not in our exhibit, but I want to show you this as a lovely, loving pair, that in ancient Egypt, in all periods that we have documentation for, men and women had the same social and legal rights. And this is absolutely astounding. There are very few cultures, ancient or modern, until the last 50 years or so, that actually this was true of. And this is true of 3,000 years of Egyptian history. Women could hold their own property, dispose of their, own prop dispose of their property as they wished. They could institute divorce, which is quite extraordinary. They could serve as witnesses to oaths. If they were found guilty by courts, they received the same punishment as men. And so you know, fair is fair in ancient Egypt. Now, from the expense of the coffin, this is a very expensive coffin. It's, it incorporates a lot of linen. This is actually part of a coffin set. This would have been enclosed in several other coffins, so it was very lavish. We can say, from the expense of this, we can safely assume that she came from an upper class family. Now, as I mentioned, we don't have the names of her, mothers, her mother or father, but again, the idea of the expense of this coffin 
linked with her job title, where other women of the same rank come from very, very good families. We assume that she also is from one of the best families or most elite families in Luxor. If she was married, we don't know that because we don't have the name of her husband or her children. She probably would have come into marriage in a more advantageous financial state than her husband. It's a very interesting thing because in ancient Egypt, elite women, when they got married, they would receive a wedding present from her parents. And this allowed her to help set up the household. In contrast, the men received their inheritance at the death of the father. And so we see women coming into these marriages very well, very well established. And there is some thought now that the very common title called Nebet Per in Egyptian, which means mistress of the house, we used to translate it as housewife, a married woman. We're now thinking that this maybe has legal ramifications, that it means that this woman actually has financial stake in that physical household. So again, this is something that's really very different in Egypt than in the rest of the world, ancient world. We know that women could hold land. There's a very famous papyrus that's in the British Museum that lists about 2,000 parcels of land, and about 10% of those are said to be the property of women. Now, although women and men were socially equal, or uh, legally equal, there were some social inequalities. Uh, for example, a woman like Mara Salman couldn't just have any old job. She had to maintain her social status. And so probably about the only way that she could earn the equivalent of money was to work in the temple. That was really the appropriate job for a woman like her. And so this limitation in how women, elite women could earn money versus men, who had a lot of different options, leads to certain very interesting traditions, financial traditions in ancient Egypt. You'll see this spectacular demotic papyrus. This is from later than Narasaman, but it records a tradition that we know is much earlier than Narasaman and continues through that time. This is an annuity contract between a man and his wife that protects her financially during the entire time of her life. Even if they're divorced, the man has to supply alimony. So it's, I mean, and it's, the legal terminology is, is, is extremely interesting. In, it is an annuity in that the woman gave her husband, and this was not at the time of their marriage, but after their marriage, because it refers to children. She gave the, her husband 30 pieces of silver, and every year in exchange, he has to give her 1.2 pieces of silver and something like 36 bags of grain, which is, which is a lot. And again, he cannot break the contract. And it says specifically on this contract that he has to deliver that annually to her in whatever house she is living. So even if they split up. And this is the way that women were financially protected. Well, the general lifestyle of a woman like Marisaman, she lived in a big town. As I said, Thebes was the largest town in Egypt. It's possible she lived in a, uh, in a multi-story townhouse because in Thebes, uh, land was at a premium. If she lived out of town, she might have been in a sprawling uh, villa. Her major duty when she was not working in the temple would be to manage her household. And she no doubt would have had a lot of servants. We know about this from records. She would have supervised uh, workers like this. This is a statue from an earlier period that's in the show showing a woman, a servant, grinding grain or a woman uh, making beer for the household. The sorts of objects Marisaman would have had around her include pottery. This is from exactly the same time as Marisaman. Another example with, with ancient leftovers. This is what happens if you don't rinse out your dishes. And then items of a personal nature. For example, a very beautiful hand mirror. You know, the perfect thing for a beautiful woman to be using. Or a comb to style her hair. Or hair styling tools, and different types of jewelry. Now, it's not known if Marisaman had children, but if she did, she would have had certain objects in her household to protect them. For example, this knife that's in the exhibit, this is an ivory knife that's decorated with scenes of gods holding knives. These gods are called the Aha gods, or the fighters. And it's thought that this was dragged on the ground around a woman and her child. It made a protective circle that kept evil away from them. And if any evil came, these little aha gods would get out their knives and attack the demons. Or another wonderful piece that's in our exhibit, this is uh, a document in, uh, in Hieratic, 
which is a curse of hieroglyphs. It was originally one long strip, and now it's broken into several strips. It would have been very carefully rolled up and hung in a tube around a child's neck. And it is a decree from the goddess Nekbet that she promises to, do, to protect a, a little, little girl, a particular little girl, from this incredible catalog of horrors that might happen, like a wall falling on her, or a genie jumping out of a well, or, or you know, just, it's, it's so paranoid when you start thinking about all these things that could happen to you. It's, it's just amazing. And so this was another means of protection. Well, in conclusion, this look at the function and role of music in ancient Egypt tries to further illuminate the life and lifestyle of Maris Amun, how she was trained as a temple singer and her apparent success in her profession as she was promoted up through the ranks to the very top rank of singer in the interior of the temple of Amun, and her specific duties playing music for the god. Hopefully it's, it's not too far-fetched to assume that she took pride in her performance and her sacred duties and that she lived a comfortable and fashionable life. Thank you very much. Rather than me take questions now, um, we'll wait for questions until after Dr. Veneer, because you might have questions that cross between us. So, thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to to be here. And so I'd like to uh, share with you some of the experience we had with uh, CT scanning of this uh, individual, uh, Marisaman. Let's see. So the uh, treatment of mummies uh, at the Oriental Institute has, hasn't always been as careful uh, <laughs> as as for this particular mummy. But fortunately, uh, this, this particular instance, the mummy escaped uh, the more destructive procedures. But we still have a curiosity about what is within this uh, highly decorated uh, coffin. And as part of that, we used a, a CT scanner. And you, know, you think about CT scanning, it's, it's really not new. It, CT scanners were introduced in the mid-70s but they've undergone this uh, tremendous technological development over the years. And we basically are visiting this particular mummy with devices that were created uh, very recently. And you'll see examples where the mummy was examined in the 1990s, but then was examined with much more recent technology including technology which is uh, you know, uh, brand new and has certain significant advantages. So let's turn the clock back to 1991. And at the University of Chicago Hospital, we had the single slice CT scanner from uh, General Electric. Of course, it's uh, long been uh, replaced, but this was what was available at the time. And so the staff uh, from the Oriental Institute uh, packed up not one, but several mummies and brought them uh, to the hospital uh, at a not the ideal uh, time of day. In any case, uh, this was, of course, uh, one of the uh, catalog descriptions of the mummy of uh, interest here, purchased in Egypt in 1920 and uh, examined uh, more than once. And now you see uh, Emily Teeter uh, in 1991 <laughs> standing next to a CT scanner. The CT scanners look almost the same. The mummies look almost the same. But uh, there are some important differences that we'd like to highlight. Uh, first of all, this is a slice that was taken uh, when they did the scans, the 21st of June at 2.08 in the morning because the amount of time required to scan was so great that it was not practical to use a hospital-based scanner in the middle of a day. So the uh, agreement was made to do this scanning, and you can see kind of an outline in uh, bright white of the scanner table and of the coffin itself, and then the wrappings around the uh, slice of the mummy within. 
And this is a picture of the typical type of CT scanner that was uh, replaced in 2004 by a 16 slice uh, CT scanner. So from one slice to 16 slices. And then some of the other mummies here in the Oriental Institute, this is one that was uh, scanned as well. And you can see a kind of a lateral view of the head. And the head is half filled with something. This is uh, the pendant portion of the head is filled with uh, a substance which is dried out after the uh, embalming uh, process. And you can also see a lateral view uh, from the time of the wrapped uh, mummy's lower extremities, the feet and the lower leg. And then this was an attempt at a 3D reconstruction for Marisamen in 1991. It has all of the attendant uh, limitations of the technology at that time. And someone has outlined here a fractured jaw uh, on the uh, mummy itself. And then you can see these inserts in the uh, eye sockets. Now let's uh, jump ahead. In January 2005, this is the tomb of uh, King Tut in the Valley of the Kings. And at that time, a National Geographic sponsored project was done. And uh, CT scanner was actually brought to on a truck uh, to the vicinity of the tomb. And then the mummy was taken uh, on this uh, wooden uh, carrier and placed within the scanner and several scans were obtained. These uh, scans have been described in the literature and were parts of, of course, National Geographic magazine and several publications. When they scanned the mummy in 2005, they used a specific CT scanner, a six slice uh, CT scanner. And they scanned it on the 5th of January and they simply uh, turned the clock back uh, 18 years and typed in Tut's birth date as 5 January 1987. So at that time, they collected about 1,700 images, and the examination was completed in about 15 minutes. Then they took the mummy out and returned it to its uh, permanent resting place. And then this is one of the images from that. You can see kind of at the top of the image is skull. And then you see some like white dots and some short lines. The short lines are like the uh, nails in this wooden carrier. And the bright dots are some inclusions. And if you look in the vicinity of the chest, it's all filled with some sort of packing material. But there's some other things that are off to the side here, which I'll show you in a moment. But uh, if you look carefully at the, the writing, you can see that they typed in the patient's name, his birth date, his uh, gender, the date of the scan. We can also, uh, they've recorded here the time of day. So they started the scan at a little after five in the afternoon. They also uh, basically have the orientation, the CT scanner model number and, and so on. So there's a good deal of information we can glean from this. If you look carefully, though, you look in the upper left-hand corner of this image, and I've blown it up here in the upper right, the, those are several kind of, they look almost amorphous uh, of, uh, of structures that outline these complicated shapes. Well, it turns out those are some of the bones, but they're not connected to the rest of the body. So several of the bones have become dislocated. The, the, Mummy was unwrapped initially and is in extremely poor shape as with, you know, examining a skeleton with the bones all disconnected and scattered around. This is, is not a good state of preservation, but at least it gives you an idea of what they had to work with in, in this reconstruction. Now I want to turn forward uh, back to July and September of uh, 2008. And we're going to visit a couple of CT scanners that came to the University of uh, Chicago. In particular, uh, you know, on the morning of uh, July, uh, this is the Oriental Institute staff bringing uh, to the emergency room of the medical center <laughs> uh, a wooden uh, crate. And the uh, crate is placed on the gurney. And uh, then several directions are given. Uh, and uh, the decorated crate is carried through the emergency room directly to the CT scanner suite. And the staff uh, from the Oriental Institute uncrated this and, of course, appropriately recorded every instant of 
what was going on. And you can see the uh, marisamen uh, being uncrated here and then very carefully being placed onto the CT scanner table. And so this is a big group effort and you can see uh, Emily Teeter is here uh, carefully uh, overlooking the uh, situation. <laughs> And, uh, and then eventually their scans are taken and the CT scanner console you can see in the foreground, in the background you can see the mummy sticking into the CT scanner itself. And so within a few minutes uh, we had uh, taken a number of acquisitions of scan data and the reconstruction proceeded uh, and the mummy was repositioned uh, several times. And this is just the appearance that you would see from the mummy uh, in the museum. Of course, never opened. You can see the laser light uh, aligning the uh, mummy's casket. You know, this is more than a human body uh, there. The body lies within the casket. So the CT scanner was, were fortunate, is large enough uh, with an aperture to accommodate not just the body, but the, uh, the entire coffin. And you can see the decoration at the uh, foot of the coffin itself and you know how it was prepared and uh, never opened. In any case, the scanning process was uh, completed in uh, a few minutes. And then this is a busy place. The CT scanner is part of the hospital. And we're doing this about 7 o'clock in the morning. But after uh, reconstructing this, we were able to uh, compare our reconstructed images, which are at the bottom two rows here. We can see one where we've made a kind of a transparent image. It looks like an x-ray and another one that looks like the solid outside of the coffin itself. And you can slice this uh, arbitrarily. I mean, one way to slice it might be to slice it in the midline in the sagittal plane or and basically this is along the spine, so you can see the neck and the spine at the bottom of the picture. You can see a portion of the coverings of the spinal cord, and you can see that the, most of the cranial cavity has been evacuated. And this is done on a purpose basis. The soft tissues are removed as part of the embalming process because they liquefy and they contribute to a deterioration. You can see the mouth is the uh, oral cavity is filled with material. This is packing material. And then the neck is packed as well. And then there's wrapping material like a, a pillow that the uh, head is uh, basically supported on. And you notice that the chin is in contact with the coffin anteriorly, the margin of the chin. So I also uh, spent a little time in the library and I looked at several books about uh, x-rays of mummies, there's been experience with this in the past. So this is a comparison of Marisamen's uh, position with the x-raying the pharaohs. And on the front cover, you'll notice that there's a picture of a skull and then the outline of the mummy and, you know, ours never unwrapped mummy there. And you basically see that the uh, angulation of the neck is different in each of these. And in our case, the chin contacts the coffin in the other case, the chin is uh, retracted away from the coffin itself. So there's a great deal of variation as you look from um, mummy coffin uh, combination from one to another in actually how things are positioned. And uh, Emily has, Teeter has pointed out to me that uh, it's common for these coffins to be uh, made, but not for a specific individual. They're uh, more of a generic container. In any case, we can compare the Marisamen made with the CT scan data obtained in 1991 with the quality of the CT scan reconstructions uh, made today. And the quality of the reconstructions is, is uh, obviously strikingly better. You can see these inclusions that are placed over the eyes. It turns out the, the actual eye balls, the, eyes, uh, the ocular globes are present, but they are shrunken and uh, these are placed just in front of them. Um, you can also see the uh, location of the mummy's uh, head and wrappings relative to the coffin. In this particular case, we've done the imaging such that you can see the skin surface covering the mummy. So the mummy's skin is there, the mummy is carefully wrapped, and we've, and depending on the views that we've made, taken the wrappings off. You can also see the 
The external ear in the appropriate position, that's also carefully wrapped as well. And then we can uh, cut the uh, uh, data sets at various orientations. We might look at the coronal uh, outline of the skull. In this particular view, you can see there's a defect here. This is a defect that was made by the embalmer. Some of the bone was removed. These are actually frontal sinuses, which are normal, but the, this portion was a track that was made in order to remove the brain contents uh, as part of the embalming process. We can also see the orientation of the uh, mummy with the arms uh, basically extended and the hands placed over the pelvis, the chin uh, extended uh, relative to the outside of the coffin, all of these images made from the CT scans. As you inspect the scans, uh, several things become clear. You can see the packing material within the uh, chest cavity. This is uh, organs, soft tissue organs have been removed and then replaced with these packets of uh, fibrous material. And there are also a number of fractures. I won't go through all of the fractures, but these fractures are clearly post-mortem because the fractures extend not just from the uh, bones, but they extend into the packing material. So clearly this couldn't have happened uh, until it was uh, long after death. There also are 12 ribs, as you'd expect, and the uh, vertebral segments in the spine were, were counted, and, and also uh, a number of anthropometric measures made. One of them, of course, would be an estimate of the overall height. Now, the height of the, the individual is actually underestimated by the height of the uh, corpse in the uh, coffin, and the reason for that is because all of the water has been removed and all of the spinal segments now contact one another because of the desiccation. You have to allow for that and also at the ends of joints the water in the cartilage is gone. So allowing for shrinkage the total height is probably around five feet six inches. There are other ways that we can estimate height and these appear to be consistent. We've studied the mummy carefully in terms of its uh, orientation relative to the uh, coffin and its uh, posture. But looking at the coffin itself, it has some interesting features. If you look carefully at this view, you'll notice that first of all, there's a crack. This crack in the coffin is uh, of course visible if you go and look carefully. You see the drips in the paint along the sides uh, as well. The facial features are impressive. If we uh, kind of zoom into that, we can see the, uh, Im the impression that the uh, constructor of this uh, made relative uh, to the face. But we also can uh, discover a number of uh, subtleties. The uh, mouth is more open on one side than the other. There's clear asymmetries in the uh, eyes and in the remainder of the coffin itself. So, so this is, is not uh, just built out of a template. There are a number of very distinctive uh, features. And then the relationship of the, uh, the head and the uh, upper torso. And if you look carefully here, you'll notice that there are a number of uh, you know, uh, inclusions that are present. Many of these are quite dense. They don't appear to be jewelry, uh, but they are dense and uh, they may very well be uh, glassine particles or some other uh, dense articles. This is uh, one thing though in the middle of the neck uh, has a sh shape of a small jewel placed there uh, on purpose. And of course you can see it's very radio dense and it projects over the neck in, in this particular view. This particular mummy has not been disarticulated, has not been mistreated. It was basically wrapped and, and uh, never uh, opened. And although there's some post-mortem fractures, they're minimal fractures, not even easy to detect. They were uh, not all found with the 1991 scans. So many of these things we've uh, discovered more recently. And uh, as we uh, look at the mummy itself, there are uh, basically uh, coverings of material, not just skin, but other uh, types of uh, packing material, resinous material in order to make uh, preservations. If you look over the front of the chest, there's a kind of a, sh a shroud, a partial shroud that's present. It has some cracks in it, but it has acted 
we think is a vapor barrier impregnated with the resinous material in order to prevent uh, the uh, entry of moisture, which of course would cause uh, deterioration. And the quality of the uh, underlying skeleton is pristine, and the quality of many of these uh, layers of wrappings, despite some uh, small, minimally displaced cracks, is also uh, very pristine. So the uh, object was, has been uh, inspected, and then the wrappings were uh, basically removed in order to allow access to the skeleton itself. This is a skeleton of a relatively young adult woman, we estimate in uh, around 30 years old, uh, someone who has uh, been well-nourished and active throughout her life, uh, has had no encounters with uh, long-term bouts of uh, illnesses which leave uh, distinctive features in the skeleton that are uh, recognizable. Although we don't know the cause of death, and that's a frequent question, what we do know is that the uh, individual was in uh, good health and active up to the time of her death. Causes of death that could be precipitous, it might be uh, infectious disease, uh, but not a lingering illness like uh, cancer or uh, heart disease would be uh, unlikely in, in this uh, age group. The other thing that, that you can see is if you take the top off of the coffin and you uh, look at it in this way, you'll notice that the orientation of the skull, the head, and you can see the eyes here and a portion of the nose and the, and the mouth, then you see where the nose is on the exterior of the coffin. You notice these two are not in alignment. Her nose points to the left and the coffin's nose points to the right. And then if you look at the shoulders, the shoulders are kind of uh, aligned uh, differently from side to side and the feet uh, portion are tilted to a different direction. So this has clearly got very distinctive asymmetries that are uh, readily dem demonstrable in, in these kinds of views. We look at the lower extremities. The lower extremities here uh, reveal uh, several uh, features. First of all, you know, you can see the uh, lower extremity uh, outlines of the bones in the knee. And uh, basically these are of an adult. The growth plates in, that are closed in uh, adolescence are uh, well closed and there's no demonstrable evidence of uh, osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease. The things that affect older adults in, in modern humans are really, she's free of those uh, types of things. Here's a comparison. This is King Tut's knee, which is, you can see is largely destroyed and uh, falling into several pieces compared to the knee of Marisamen. And uh, this is the growth plate of the knee. This is the uh, thigh bone at the uh, knee and this is the lower leg uh, bone. The knee joint would be here and you have essentially contact of bone on bone because the cartilage has been desiccated. Um, in the King Tut you can see the bones are all in fragments and that the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate is still open. They estimated as the age of death as 19 but it would be very uh, inconsistent with the appearance of a 19 year old today. Uh, growth plates are usually closed by uh, earlier adolescence. We also have the uh, feet. This is the pictures of the feet from uh, Marisamen. You can see the uh, bones of the, the feet and the, the toes. You can see in this particular foot, the right foot, you'll notice the alignment is uh, a little bit uh, different than on the other side. Uh, a normal alignment for a great toe would be for it to be uh, in a straight line like on the left hand foot. The right hand foot you'll notice that the proximal portion, the first metatarsal, it has this linear alignment but the distal portion, the bones of the toe are pointed off to the right. So this is called hallux valgus and oftentimes uh, we see a bunion that develops here. So these are, these are features which you know we can pick out from these kinds of examinations but basically shows uh, maybe she was uh, doing some dancing as well and that may have caused some problems with uh, whatever choice of footwear she had. 
Then, then in August of 2008, a group of us went to visit uh, Phillips headquarters in, in Cleveland and uh, basically uh, uh, to look at a next generation of CT scanners. So this is in the factory with the CT scanner covers off. In any case, this particular one is a 256 slice uh, CT scanner, basically a prototype unit which came to the university uh, uh, shortly thereafter. So now we move forward to 6th of September, and this is the delivery of this ICT to the University of Chicago. The room is ready in the hospital, and uh, this truck pills up on the Saturday morning uh, b before 8 o'clock, and uh, then from the back of it uh, comes this uh, device, and all 9,800 pounds of it. So uh, a group of us uh, were there in order to uh, escort it into the uh, hospital, and uh, transport it into the uh, room. And fortunately, the door was large enough to admit the, <laughs> the scanner itself. And, and so it undergoes this commissioning process. It takes uh, several days to install. A number of uh, experts do that. And our first patient arrived. <laughs> so, uh, so at this time, we're ready to, uh, to scan. Uh, the dental maxillofacial structures are extremely important in any uh, post-mortem examination. Here's a panoramic view of the dental arch. These are the kinds of views your dentist uh, would get when they uh, you s sit in this machine that rotates around your head and it captures all of your teeth. Why is that so interesting? Well, it turns out that in this individual, first of all, she has all of her teeth, all 32 teeth. That means uh, all of her permanent teeth are present, including the wisdom teeth, which are well erupted. Second thing is that there are no caries, no evidence of any cavities. The commonest cause of tooth loss in a modern human would be periodontal disease or bone loss at the attachments, the bony attachments around the teeth, and she doesn't have any periodontal disease. So her dental health is, is actually extremely good, but there are some other distinctive features of her teeth. These are some pictures of the human mandible and teeth. And, you know, the teeth anatomy, you have the crown, which is the enamel portion of the tooth, and then you have the dentin and the, uh, basically the uh, root canals and roots of teeth. And if you, you know, if you get uh, infection in this area or some sort of uh, degenerative uh, phenomena, it either causes tooth loss or an abscess, pain, necessity for endodontal uh, treatment and so on. She doesn't have any of that. But she does have this, and this would be examples, clinical examples of bruxism. This is what happens when people grind their teeth. Sometimes they'll do it in their sleep, and the teeth become severely worn at the occlusal surface, the surface where they touch each other. And her teeth are severely worn. I don't think it's because she ground her teeth in her sleep. I think what happens is that it's basically something related to her diet and to the uh, the uh, nature of the types of food that she had available. If we look at the pelvis, the pelvis is also an important feature in a, in a mummy. First of all, you can tell the gender from the pelvis. And uh, this is a picture of the pelvis. The arms are uh, laying over the pelvis. This is more like an x-ray view. And then we can uh, take out and take a single slice through this. You see the hip joints here. This is one hip. This is the other hip. And you'll notice that, first of all, the hips are very well developed, but there's no osteoarthritis. There's no wear on these hips that indicates uh, signs of, uh, of aging. She's fully developed. She's an adult. But uh, this is uh, an active individual as well. And how can we tell that she's an active individual and underwent the development so well? Well, bones are almost like a phenomenon, almost like tree rings. I mean, the Bones don't develop all at one time. They develop gradually as you mature. And so a portion of this uh, bone was been laid down throughout her life up through the time that she became mature. And then once you become mature, the bones will not remain uh, intact and remain healthy unless you're active. You, you have to use them. So there are trophic factors that have to be present, one of which is weight bearing and exercise and so on. So this, uh, first of all, her cortical bone, the bone of the shaft of the largest bone in the body, which is the femur, is extremely well mineralized. She has no bone loss. 
She could not have this if she was not an active, well-developed, and well-nourished individual. So another th question that have been asked a number of times was about childbirth. And childbirth doesn't always leave distinctive features. Uh, I presume that uh, cesarean uh, was not available at the time. So giving normal vaginal birth, one of the things that happens is that the bones of the pelvis, which meet in the midline anteriorly and off to the sides in the, uh, around the sacrum, uh, can have some spurring that takes place. And we can recognize this in, in CT scans in modern humans and uh, tell if a female has had multiple vaginal births or, or not. But that doesn't seem to be a feature here. So it, distinctive evidence proving that she was, uh, had multiple vaginal births is not present. Um, another thing is that if you just look at the pelvis in general, uh, an expert who looks at this sort of thing can tell you confidently this is a gynecoid pelvis. It's a pelvis that belongs to a woman. You know that because the pelvic inlet is ovoid. In a male, it's usually round. Another thing that tells you is the obtuse pelvic angle. In other words, the outlet of the pelvis is, is this wide angle, which again is necessary for childbirth. It's a distinctive feature of, of female uh, anatomy. And then we have uh, made a number of uh, sequences of this. I mean, we have uh, made almost 100,000 slice reconstructions. And then from those, we've uh, used them in order to make uh, short motion sequences like this one, just to illustrate the uh, features that are present in the intrinsic three-dimensionality of this data. But I think one of the things that's uh, very unusual, Dr. Teeter and myself, and uh, you know, everyone at the Oriental Institute, I think would like to depart from the norm in, uh, in CT scanning of these uh, mummies. And uh, it's our intention to make all of the data that we've collected available. And it's definitely not the norm because most uh, of the mummy CT scans, which have been going on for a number of different years, have never been shared with anyone else. And I think this is a, a real mistake and it's just counter to our own philosophy that we should share uh, as much of the scientific data uh, as we can. And you can see the, the start to appreciate the quality of the uh, CT scan uh, data sets. The CT scan data sets provide details really up to the limit of human vision. And you know, it's difficult to show on a projection screen. Sometimes if you uh, use some uh, zooming and magnification and rotation, you can begin to appreciate the exquisite amount of uh, detail that is really available in these uh, these data sets. I think some of the other things about these uh, data sets that are important are being able to extract certain regions of anatomy. I made several points about the, the teeth themselves, but here you can see the uh, three-dimensionality of the dental anatomy. You can see the uh, degree of wear that has taken place uh, at the crowns of these teeth and at the occlusal surfaces. You can see uh, this crack in the uh, mandible of non-displaced uh, fracture there in the jawbone. And uh, also she has a small anterior overbite, which is uh, visible on these. So, so many features are, are, uh, are visible and, and provable uh, distinctively with the images that we have. So I think with that, I, we had a nice uh, visit with uh, Mara Simon and, and many of uh, the features here. I think we'd all be delighted to answer your uh, questions. Thank you very much.